thank you everybody. So now I'm the second moderator. <laughs> uh, so as he mentioned before, Kevin Mueller with Thornton Tomasetti in Chicago. Uh, this work was actually done with uh, two previous colleagues of mine. We still work together on stuff, but we actually all worked at Jensen Hughes before. Stephen Stacy, who already had to leave to get back to Chicago. And Anthony Bentevegna, who's in the back here, um, both with Jensen Hughes. And so we actually wrote this paper um, to really address the application of concrete spalling in design, uh, especially with new structures, uh, and kind of move ourselves from a prescriptive world to a performance-based world. So we actually kind of already talked on performance um, and you know fire ratings. So you have your one-hour, two-hour fire ratings that are very typical in design. Embedded in that one or two hour fire rating are the following things. Uh, so for your fire exposure, it was a standard time temperature curve, that ASCM E119 that you've already seen, that was the fire that it was subject. The performance limit or the, the requirement that allows it to be pass or fail is simply that the temperature increase on the unexposed surface can't exceed a difference of 139 degrees Celsius um, from the fire, or it can't from its ambient condition. So it can't increase uh, by more than that during the fire. Structural damage wise, you just, you can't have failure. So your, your beam, column, whatever it is that you're trying to get a fire resistance rating for, as long as it doesn't fail, uh, you're fine. Now, what does failure mean? It's not well defined. So to me, you know, complete loss of load carrying capacity would be failure. But for a lot of times, there could be a serviceability limit. You could fail because you deflected six inches and that may be a failure for that particular uh, building or that particular situation that you're working in. So there is no serviceability limits whatsoever. Structure restraints are defined, and that's a big question mark. Is it restrained, is it unrestrained? I don't have time to go into that during this talk. It's a whole other argument to be had. But regardless, there's an inherent restraint on the end boundary conditions for all of your fire resistance ratings, and not really knowing what those are, or not properly defining them can cause problems. And then what we're really interested in is spalling mitigation. So it's just inherent, right? If structural fail failure is simply designed as, or defined as the loss of load carrying cap uh, capability, you could have spalled a ton. You could have several inches of spalling and it still not fail. Uh, or you could have no spalling and it did fail. Um, the failure limit again is a temperature rise of 139 degrees Celsius. So where, what happened to concrete spalling? Where, where did it go? Um, and is it even embedded in any of our fire resistance ratings? When we go to a performance base world, <laughs> everything now becomes specific to the problem at hand. Your fire exposure is threat specific. So where are you at? Are you a bridge fire, a deck fire, a building fire, an industrial type fire? Uh, there, I, I, your temperature increase, we may not even care about. Maybe we're not really worried about protecting the fire between different rooms. Uh, we're more concerned with its structural load carrying cap, uh, capability. So that may go away. What damage can you incur? You may have buildings and uh, structural elements where very little damage is allowed because of the importance of the building. Or you may have others where, sure, you could take those six inches of deflection, doesn't matter. So all of the actual response limits become uh, specific to the element. The restraint can actually be calculated. So who cares if it's restrained or unrestrained in the fire resistance ratings? What kind of a connection do you have? Let's model it. Let's look at the beam column connection. For concrete, most everything's monolithic. We can put that into our models. So now spalling mitigation become, can become environment specific. And this is where we need to go into detail on how to address concrete spalling. So moisture exposure, that's one really big element. How much and what's the level of service, gra service level gravity load as a percentage of the capacity of your member? So are you really loading it up to 20, 30% or are you more in the five to 10% range? That can have a big effect on spalling. Your cover depth. Uh, what allowable damage are you even going to um, be okay with? So if you're, say, in a tunnel situation and you got you know, concrete spalling down on the first responders coming in, that's a bad thing. If you have a big building and some spalling comes down off a wall, maybe that's okay. Again, we can be very specific to our situation. Um, and then also what the building official is even going to allow. Um, and that's always the big question. So outline for the talk. I uh, want to give an overview for North American standards and what we have to work with and where spalling is actually addressed. Go through concrete spalling mitigation from both a materials and a structural standpoint. Uh, go through our proposed design procedure with some summary and conclusions. So overarching building codes, right? IBC, we want to talk North America, we can throw National Building Code of Canada in there, um, but they're pretty much roughly the same, right? Uh, NBC, no mention of concrete spalling. IBC is no better. They shove it at the end of a table. I believe this is in chapter seven. It's in the footnote of a table, which you know that means it's really important. 
uh, and you pull it out, I try to zoom in, um, adequate provisions against spalling shall be provided by U-shaped or hooped stirrups, space not to exceed the depth of the member with a clear cover of one inch. Very specific rules for apparently addressing spalling for all situations. Um, I don't really agree that this is what should be needed, but this is what the IBC defines um, as spalling. ASC 7, we're gonna break it up. So pre-2016, no mention of even fire loading anywhere in the, in the document. So of course, no mention on concrete spalling. But post-2016, we'll have Appendix E, which added performance-based design procedures uh, for, fire, for fire effects on structures. And here, we now have concrete spalling discussed throughout this uh, appendix. The problem is that we still don't have explicit mitigation options. So they say, it's a problem. You need to look at it. Here's what could cause it. Good luck, essentially. They don't say good luck, but I add that in. So, you know, they, they define stuff like section loss resulting from fire exposure because of spalling or charring may also contribute to significant forces, rotations, deflections, and deformations of members and connections. That's pretty much the limit of how they address concrete spalling. Um, so in this presentation, we're hoping to actually address how to do it and what steps should be taken. So from a structural response, ASCM 119 is the governing uh, fire time temperature curve for our, for our standards. Um, and again, spalling can occur. It doesn't really care. Uh, it cares about structural failure. That's what fails your tests. Um, so in order to have a two-hour fire resistance rating, you need to withstand the temperature to a certain amount on the unexposed surface and also not fail. Um, it doesn't really care if they're spalling as long as you still meet those other requirements. NFPA 502 um, does actually have some information in there. So if you follow the prescriptive-based design part of NFPA 502, um, you have temperature limits for the heated concrete surface and the steel reinforcement. The performance-based design portion, fire-induced spalling shall be prevented. It's a blanket statement. Um, that's almost a little too strict. Fire-induced spalling shall be prevented. It's very hard to completely prevent concrete spalling. Uh, we can mitigate it, but to prevent it is a little strong. Um, and then they also say that you cannot have any damage and deformation that's irreversible. So it has to be able to come back and you've got to be able to actually you know, get into your structure and be able to use it. So we're kind of going to two, NFPA 502 does at least mention concrete spalling. So from a material standpoint, there's really two main protection strategies. So supplemental fire protection, which is what's common. Um, some kind of a passive fire protection surface applied to protect um, the concrete surface. You have a higher initial cost, and you definitely have life cycle maintenance requirements. So as long as the owner is okay with these and knowing that they have to maintain it and support it and make sure it's installed correctly, this is a viable option. If not, we can go to concrete mixture composition. We can actually optimize the concrete mixture from the very start of the project and look at how the constituents and mixture proportions are all going together and even do testing and petrographic analyses on these concrete samples to mitigate your risk of concrete spalling down. So you have a slightly higher initial cost, but now you have no maintenance. Whatever you do to that concrete mix is inherent in the mix design. So once you move to construction, you're using that mix design throughout and you have your standard normal quality control measures and as long as you're using that mix design appropriately, you've mitigated your spalling risk. You don't actually have to maintain that concrete mixture throughout the life of the building. It's important to, measure, to note that, of course, this analysis is not an exact, si <coughs> exact science, excuse me. And standardized testing is not really available. We have furnaces, we have things that we can look at, but it's really an engineering effort. Um, there's no you know, ASTM standard to look at concrete spalling for this. So concrete mixture composition really starts with the aggregates, right? So you have calcareous aggregate, siliceous aggregate, or lightweight um, aggregate concrete you know, mixtures. That's pretty much what you have. You have um, uh, high strength concrete, but they're usually still using one of these aggregates. So calcareous aggregate, your limestone, has a high heat capacity and it's pretty high stability. So you have a low spawn potential uh, typically for calcareous concrete. Silicious is the other end of the spectrum, low heat capacity, low stability. So you get a higher spawning potential if you use silicious aggregate. Lightweight concrete, I should be more uh, uh, specializing in how I define that, can vary, all depending on how you actually construct um, your lightweight aggregate. So there's a lot of things that have to go into how you batch it, how much water is there when you actually batch it, um, your air entrainment, things like that. But it's variable. So you can have good, um, small, or reduce your spawning potential with lightweight aggregate, but it could also be worse. So you really have to engineer that if you're going to go that route. 
Uh, the quantity and the type of the cementitious materials also impact concrete spalling. Uh, the higher the cementitious content, typically the higher the water demand, so you have an increased spalling potential, because a lot of that uh, water gets captured and it's just inherent in the concrete after fully casting and curing, um, and it's still there to cause spalling down the road. Then also supplementary uh, cementing materials, so silica fume, slag, slag cement, fly ash, all of these have effects on the concrete in different proportions and different uses with different aggregates. So all of these should be looked at in detail if you're actually doing a concrete mixture um, kind of optimization. And the final thing is polypropylene fibers. Um, and this has been well studied and, and it's fairly well defined that if you add polypropylene fibers to your mix, uh, they're, they're thin, they're small, and they melt at a low temperature. And so when those actually melt, they provide a, a kind of a cavity or a conduit for water to escape out of your concrete. The important part for polypropylene fibers is you can't put too many, uh, you can't put too little, they can't be too long, they can't be too thick, and they have to be batched correctly. So if you don't batch it right, you could have a huge chunk of concrete with all your fibers and nothing everywhere else. Uh, so there's some very important things that need to be considered if you're going to use polypropylene fibers. From a structural standpoint, now we've got other concerns. So even if we mitigate the risk of concrete spalling down as much as we possibly can with the, with the mixture optimization and you know, the right cement materials and everything we need, you could still have concrete spalling. That's, my, that's what I don't like about NFPA 502. It's really difficult to completely prevent it. So from a structural standpoint, there are things we can do to say, well, if spalling does happen, let's at least cover the loads that get induced due to spalling. And let's try to actually take care of that up front and not wait for something bad to happen. So the first big one is spalling-induced eccentricity. <clears throat> what happens for this is I just have a standard concrete wall here, could be any element, uh, but this really occurs when you only have one side fire. So especially for concrete walls, you're enclosing a room, fire happens on one side of the room. So since the fire is only happening on one surface, you're getting unsymmetrical degradation of the concrete and the steel. So this part that I just shaded, let's just imagine that as the fire went on, that concrete's lost a significant amount of strength and the rebar is um, degraded. The other side, the unheated surface, is perfectly fine. But your load, the arrow with the dashed line there at the far right, remains concentric to the initial, the original cross-section of the wall at ambient conditions. And since you've only degraded from one side, that axial load is now eccentric with respect to the rest of the cross-section. That causes an overturning moment that'll actually send this wall towards the furnace. If you don't have that vertical and horizontal rebar there on the unheated surface, uh, this wall could fail catastrophic buckling failure because there's absolutely nothing to take the tension in this wall. I've seen it happen twice in my PhD work. If you have the rebar there, then you're covering the tension loads as this tries to bend towards the furnace. Uh, the big part for this is that ACI 318, if you have a thin enough wall, allows only one mat of horizontal and vertical rebar. So you could have a design that meets ACI 318 with one mat of rebar in the middle, this occur, and you'd have your wall completely fail because you have no tension reinforcement. It's important to recognize this and implement this into your design, especially if you think that you have a uh, concrete spalling potential. The second is sacrificial rebar layers. It was kind of already, I believe it was brought up some here, what happens if we just increase the cover. Increasing the cover doesn't do a lot as far as spalling goes, because spalling goes all the way to the first rebar that it hits. So for whatever reason, the rebar opens up enough cavities and moisture can escape. So everything that I've seen for uh, concrete elements under spalling, the first rebar cage basically that it comes to stops the spalling. So just simply increasing the cover doesn't do it. But increasing the cover and introducing a new sacrificial layer of reinforcement, that will do it. Um, and so take this picture, for example, the blue shaded portion is your core of your wall, the structural core. That's what the structural engineer is considering in their design. So they're going to take this and whatever the strength of that blue shaded portion, that's going to be your wall. The orange shaded portion is the portion that I put in to mitigate concrete spalling. So if it's going to go until it hits that first layer of reinforcement, which is in my sacrificial layer zone. So it can spall off. I still then have whatever cover is left from that sacrificial labor layer to the actual core layer in the blue that will remain as concrete cover. And that I can move. So if I want more cover in that one, that's the distance that I need to play with. Um, this way it stops the concrete spalling and also provides easier access to repair because you can actually take all of this surface cover off. It was sacrificial to begin with and you could put something new on um, and it's still acting as insulation and you haven't ruined the actual structural part of the wall. Um, so our proposed design procedure to bring everything together here. So this is what we'd like, obviously, 
for the industry to, to go forward. It kind of encompasses what we would like to see. So you first start off with is passive protection desired, allowed, um, or recommended. So that you might have a client that really likes passive fire protection. They have that nice system up there. If they need to replace it, they can, and it completely separates the structure from uh, the fire. If you do that, you have your prescriptive approach, you can provide your passive protection, and you can move on. If not, you're gonna have to go to a performance-based approach, especially when it comes to concrete spalling. There are no prescriptive approaches for concrete spalling out there. Once you get into your performance-based approach, there's three main things. Your concrete mixture optimization, your heat transfer analysis, and your structural analysis. So the concrete mixture optimization is what you do right at the beginning. You work with the batch plant, uh, the contractor on site. You get a concrete mix design that's going to work and be fully optimized. You can look at the archetype, the cementitious materials. You can play with the polypropylene fibers. From there, you can even do more analyses. You can do petrographic, analysis, uh, petrographic analyses or even actual full-scale fire tests if you wanted, you know, not full scale, but something more reduced, just looking at the concrete material properties, not the structure. Once you have that down, uh, then you can go into the heat transfer because you're going to need your surface temperature and your rebar temperatures to really inform what you're going to do in the structural analysis portion and design that part around the concrete spalling. So by following this, you cover all the aspects. We design around concrete spalling. We also reduce our risk and we have a nice, um, you know, nice design procedure for engineers to follow. Um, to kind of get around the fact that we have nothing in any of our codes to address this. So a couple quick summaries and conclusions. So North America is already moving to performance-based standards. We already have it in ASCE 7. Um, we're hoping to implement it through a few ACI codes um, already. NFP 502 regarding tunnels, they're already there. So there's already stuff in, in the documents and in our standards and what building officials are going to be expecting us to follow. And we need to, you know, we need to actually catch up with respect to concrete spalling. Um, so there's a lot of different textbooks that have different things that are very useful to look at. Um, but as far as concrete spalling is concerned, I think ACI needs to be the one that actually drives that forward and defines the best way to do that.